So I'll take it from here. I'm Mary Dickinson. I'm the president-elect of the society. Um, and I am going to introduce today, Dr. Ray Keller. Let me share with you my slides. Right. So the society confers yearly the Developmental Biology Society for Developmental Biology Lifetime Achievement Award. The award is named in this way to illustrate the long partnership between the journal and the society. And the award is given to a senior developmental biologist, usually in the third third of their career, in recognition of his or her outstanding and sustained contributions to the field as well as exceptional mentoring and service to the scientific community. This year's recipient is Dr. Ray Keller, the Alumni Council Thomas Jefferson Professor of Biology at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Ray has made outstanding scientific contributions for the last 50 years. He's been an exceptional role model and mentor to many, and he is also one of our great educators. I have to say that it was just a pleasure reading through the thick packet of nomination letters really from so many people that love Ray. John Wallingford wrote that Ray really puts the lifetime in lifetime achievement and indeed Ray's very first paper, sorry, advance the slide, whoops. Ray's very first paper, part of his PhD work was published in 1975 in developmental biology. The paper and its follow-up in 1976 have been cited hundreds of times. Darcy Kelly noted that the only problem with awarding Ray Keller a Lifetime Achievement Award is that neither his lifetime nor his achievements have reached their maxima. And indeed, Ray's most recent paper on this topic was published earlier this year with no sign of slowing down. Ray's work on morphogenic Genetic movements and gastrulation and Xenopus. Uh, Ray, Ray works on morphogenetic movements and gastrulation and Xenopus slavis. He's passionate about it. Um, but Amy Sater recalled Ray saying that he started working on frog gastrulation because it was hard. He figured that he could fail and then he could go back to just riding motorcycles. As some of you know, Ray's first passion is for motorcycles, his hogs, if you will, and he ascribes to the belief that you should always have many motorcycles. Cycles, uh, kind of an N plus one philosophy. Ray's work really popularized the use of quantitative and computational methods combined with classical developmental biology, blending such beautiful cell biology and imaging with physical mechanisms. His studies have inspired the work of countless others, including myself, and he has already left an incredible legacy of knowledge. He will no doubt share more about that with you today. But that's not all. Ray is an amazing storyteller, a warm and genuine raconteur with the keen ability to take complicated multi-dimensional ideas and to illustrate them with folksy analogies, the so-called Rayisms that we're fond of. If you're struggling with the idea of conversion extension, he might say to think of it as piglets fighting for their way to suckle on the mother hog, or a tuna can with the top and sides removed in the process of being turned inside out. Marianne Bronner recalled stories of him referring to himself as the Clint Eastwood of cut and page biology. And if you're lamenting the difficulty of an experiment, he might reply that doing good science means learning how to solve your own goddamn silly ass problems. We all know that you don't eat a Keller sandwich, but if there's a sandwich around, it might be, it might make a good prop for Ray. Asako Shindo recalled a conversation where Ray bent and twisted and flattened his, his croissant sandwich, almost rendering it useless to illustrate how the forces in his model changed tissue shape. Finally, Ray has also been an extraordinary mentor and motivator. His humble and approachable style and his love for talking science really draws people in. Time, space, and any perceived hierarchies disappear. He and Anne are so very generous and so welcoming to those that want to learn and collaborate. 
this tree shows his direct trainees. You can't read it because they all won't fit on the slide, but there's a link down there on the bottom if you want to zoom in. And these are only his scientific children. It doesn't include his scientific grandchildren or any of his adopted mentees, those that he taught and inspired at Berkeley or at UVA, at Woods Hole, in the Cold Spring Harbor uh, Xenopus course, or on the back porch of his house or over a beer at an SDB meeting. In Ray's mind, all who love science should be welcome in science. We need everyone. There are so many problems that we don't even know about because after all, and this is my final Rayism, you'll, you'd be surprised where you can hide a moose. So cheers to this year's uh, SDB Lifetime Achievement winner, the larger than life, the national treasure, Ray Keller. And I will stop sharing and allow Ray to share his presentation. Well, can anyone hear me? Yep. You have a box on your slide, though. Uh, uh oh, we can't uh -oh. seem to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, it's the um, we opened up the questions. And then... the, yeah, yeah, it's a chat thing, and we can't get rid of it uh, for some reason. Hmm. Um, that's the uh, build order box. Um, Pardon. Do you have a build opener box? A build opener. Build order. If you stop sharing and close the Q&A, then you can um, share again. Can't, can't close the Q&A. That's the problem. Where's it at? Um, stop sharing. Stop sharing. OK. All right. And then, um, maybe go ahead and um, go back to sharing. OK. Share screen. All right. And then, now pick instead of that, pick the uh, base, pick your desktop. Or no, that won't that won't work either. Pick desktop pick. There. Yeah. Huh. Now share. Share. Okay. All right. Now. Let's play. All right. And play. No, they're gonna see. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. All right. Uh, is that uh, yes. everybody's uh, happy? At the, at the very top, sure. there's a button to swap the display. Uh, it's next to the X. Yeah. Okay. There we now. go. There you go. Okay. Uh, so the room can see my pointer? Yes, we can. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your... Well, um, uh, thank you uh, for that amazing introduction. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the SDB Society for giving me this award, and I'd like to thank all the people who um, uh, worked on nominating me. And uh, I was totally surprised when uh, I found out about this. Um, I've never really viewed myself as an <clears throat> award kind of guy, um, and I deeply appreciate it. I'm humbled by it, and uh, yeah, I. Thank you so much. And um, I think, you know, the reason for my title here is that I think uh, it's more about, it's less about me than it is about we. It should be us, but it's dramatically incorrect. But I think it, it sounds better. It's not about me, it's about, about uh, we. And that's all my friends and all the adventures I've had with. Uh, our fellow morphogeneticists over the years. So I want to briefly take you through uh, some events in my life and things that happened that, were, that I shared with so many of my friends and what they contributed to it. I came straight off the farm. Um, I went to Southeast Missouri State College and worked on the farm all the way through college until 67. Um, uh, and then I got an NSF fellowship. Uh, it was partly because of Sputnik and the missile gap they started spending more and more money on uh, tech, high tech stuff um, was um, uh, we trying to catch up with the Russians. 
and they expanded the program, I was told. And uh, my brother and I both got sucked up into research, him into engineer, mathematics and engineering and, and uh, me in biology. And I went to um, Champaign, uh, Urbana uh, to graduate school. My mentor after the army, uh, I had a rough start, got drafted, lost my deferment, uh, as everybody did, nearly everybody did then. And, um, during the Vietnam War, and uh, Dave Stokem was an incredible mentor. We, um, he was, he allowed us to have independence, and we'd argue uh, constantly. It was a bit big discussions. It was a really loud lab, and we'd go back and forth arguing about everything from um, uh, science to religion to uh, uh, music, pretty much everything. Here are some of the undergraduates, the three of my favorite undergraduates were, who were in the lab. You might recognize a couple of them. Um, it was a wonderful place. And he gave me a lot of, uh, uh, Stokem gave me a lot of room to move. Um, so then uh, my project was to re-examine um, the um, old uh, selective adhesion hypothesis, selective affinity hypothesis of um, Johannes Holfreder, but um, uh, try to relate that to um, Holfreder found if you mix uh, cells or tissues from the three primary germ layers, they would recognize each other as uh, either alike or different, and they would um, uh, develop positive and negative affinities, and depending on how you started the experiment, what configuration they would resort into embryoid-like things that would mimic parts of gastrulation. Um, this didn't go very far. It was pretty disappointing because the technology for looking at cell surface molecules was pretty bad then. And also, these, this progression, uh, uh, sorting out and making these uh, uh, pseudo-gastroids was way too slow to keep up with the gastrulation in this very fast developing. This is a new model system then, and it just raced right out from under this process. And so we realized this was not happening fast enough to be relevant to the gastrulation um, and turned out to be the solutions. Um, we now know that, but we know that then. So I defaulted to making a vital dye map of the gastrula and um, that uh, those first two papers that you saw there that evolved over the over time, it uh, wound up being a very descriptive thesis, but it formed a foundation and we updated it. A number of people updated it, and it's complicated. Not many people use it because it has all the details in it and it's three dimensional, and hidden in here it was it, uh, it was good that we did it because we had a descriptive base that allowed us to see things that other people had not, would not, were unaware of. And still, there are things in here that are ignored by the field and they shouldn't be because uh, they, they're making mistakes. I met Gary Schoenwolf there and we did a descriptive study too. He knew SEM, scanning electron microscopy. And I saw these protrusions in that embryo and, and you know, I just, I had to do something about that. So um, I went off to Trink's lab, uh, John Trink is at Yale University. He studied cell behavior in embryos and also in cell culture, uh, the fungulus, uh, 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 heteroclitus, the killifish. Um, and I started working on Xenopus there and I made movies to all parts of around uh, the gastrula and did a planimetric exercise here of just looking at the spreading or contraction of the cells all over. We developed the database and what was happening all around on the outside here. And I did that by uh, making a chamber that uh, uh, a tuberculin syringe using two of the um, grommets for bearing with a little handle. And I could roll the embryo backwards as it came forward and make uh, movies at pretty high magnification um, of the cells that were involved in this elongation. And one of the things we first found out was um, that these things could slide by one another. This was a heretical idea in those days. It pretty much had to happen, but there actually there actually was some evidence that this that this uh, it, it was it was not really visualized until I think probably this this uh, paper in 1978. And so I had to put that on the back burner because the low hanging fruit was epiboly. And since I knew what was going on on the outside, no cells were leaving 
or entering this outer superficial layer here. But it was multiple layers thick and they had a couple of deep layers. So what the hell was going on there? Well, I uh, plotted, I, we can't see these things, we can, we can do a better job now than it could then, but basically I plotted the maximum extent of every cell I could find in a particular region and laid it out in an analysis of overlap and looking at this at uh, various intervals in this thing it was clear at the end there was no other alternative interpretation that they were radially intercalating. And we named it radial intercalation because it was along the radial axis of the embryo, the radii of the embryo. Now um, this is how it worked. Uh, my model was that it was boundary capture. The deep cells would come up through here and attach and be captured there by a strong adhesion and that would force this thing into this kind of an array. Um, 20 years later, Doug D. Simone and Doug D. Simone's lab, uh, Mungo Marsden and, and Doug, uh, found out that integrin fibronectin signaling was essential for this intercalation and also that it polarized the division such that they were in this plane um, that aided the spreading. And then almost another 20 years later, Zabo et al. in um, Roberto Maior's lab um, discovered that C3A, the chemoattractant, was made by the superficial layer and the receptors were found in the deep layer and there's a chemoattraction here. Uh, amazing. And um, they did some modeling that sort of rescued my old boundary capture in that they, in their model they had to uh, invoke a little bit of boundary capture here to get the whole thing work. So this, um, um, uh, I was, this is one of the great joys of this business, you know, to have something that you worked on earlier, never worked on for, well, I never really got back to, to that. And, uh, and to see it all unfold over 40 years, it's um, nearly 40 years, it's amazing. Um, and I gotta say something about this guy. Uh, he, he loved life and he loved science. And um, yeah, he was, he was one of the really great mentors I've had. Um, then I did a short, it wasn't all that short, I worked on Norcrest migration with Bob Briggs in uh, Bloomington. And he's actually the guy who taught me to ride a motorcycle. Um, uh, but I can't take about, I'm, I can only follow a couple of threads or one thread actually through my career. Uh, so I'll go on to Berkeley um, and convergence and extension. I had this in mind because of that cell, that elongation of that, those, uh, and separation of those cells along the axis in those early movies. And I wanted to get at this. Um, so you know what happens here, everybody on the planet probably knows by now, but um, the marginal zone rolls inside and as it does so, it converges and extends. It gets narrower in the medial lateral axis and longer in the AP and it basically pushes the butt away from the head on every vertebrate known and in some chordates. Uh, but when you see this grand sweep of the of movements in the embryo, you can't, you've got to find some way to do reductionist biology on this. So what I did was I cut out a piece of this dorsal lip and put it into culture and as a sandwich. Now the reason I use a sandwich is because we had to have a protective epithelium around it. Remember I said that the media, it, that we just couldn't get deep cells to behave properly. Or, or to do anything um, interesting. And so it's covered with an epithelium and you put it in culture like this, both the neural region here and the mesendodermal region here will converge and extend, elongate. And now this is totally unattached to a substrate. And this is what most people are, well, it's gotta be stuck to a cover slip. No, uh, we put it on agarose. It bent in this particular one, but that's uh, uh, because we made it a little bit asymmetric. Now this drew the attention of some uh, uh, biomechanician, a big scale biomechanician at Berkeley, Mimi Cole, one of my dear collaborators, and a young engineer whose project had sort of uh, uh, blown up under him uh, uh, because of the nature of the uh, machine he was using. But his machine turned out to be, whoa. Uh oh, all right, the gremlin is back. Um, Start, start keynote again. Okay. Where is it? Right here. Okay. Oh, 
Okay. <laughs> what we're going to do is skip that slide. Okay, and then we've got, we don't have You're this. Good. You're good. Uh, can everybody hear me? No, we're not good. You're back up and up. Yeah, we're uh, back up. That was a poison slide, and we just ran through it about five times, and we managed to get past it. And so we thought it, we had the problem. I'm sorry. Anyway, the bottom line of that is that uh, explant, we put it in it. We put it in that a, a measure, a force measuring machine, and Mimi said, if that thing is is extending by itself like that, it's a, it's it's probably getting stiff and it's probably pushing. And so we measured that. We measured the the, the, the stiffness goes up only in the axis of extension, uh, three to four fold during at the onset of this convergence and extension. And it, we measured the pushing force at about a half micro. Uh, Newton, but it actually is probably much more than that. Um, and that really set the cat among the pigeons because every, up to that point, everyone thought that the that morphogenesis occurred by flo uh, cells flowing from, uh, that they were liquids and, and they um, um, assorted by uh, surface tension. And they may still do. In fact, we have a paper now that says that that is involved in some things. But the fact that this thing was stiff and would push back against things that was, um, uh, it, it was hard for a lot of people to buy. Now we wanted to get inside that thing to see what the cells were doing, but we had bad media. And so um, um, uh, we needed a, a, a buffer as Mike Danilchek says, and I had been complaining about this. Christian Bowd sent me a, a, a letter saying that there was a paper in the journal Physiology on a composition of the blasted seal fluid was described in two species. And I had that, I had just torn that letter open and I was headed down to the Steinhardt lab. Ian Drummond bumps into me and I said, hey to Ian, take a look at this. And he, and he says, yeah, I got you the paper. And he handed the paper to me and then I turn around and this is within 30 feet in about eight minutes. I bump into Mike Danilchek who'd come down because he was trying to make a solution. And he went back up to Stanley Hall and made it up that afternoon. It went through two versions, two more versions, ending with Amy Sater, who civilized it. She was also in the, in the Steinhardt lab. And that was a big plus. Um, uh, the pH was eight to eight three, which the original Holfreder solution was. And uh, it really made these cells pop, these deep cells pop. Um, uh, uh, yeah, there. The next thing that happened out there was fluorescent dextrans. These had been pioneered by Dave Weisblatt and uh, uh, Bob Gimlick and, and John Garrett's lab and uh, Yolkin Brown in the Stent lab had just revised some of those and we used them. And two young men, uh, Paul Wilson and John Schur, uh, started imaging those deep cell explants, which would now converge and extend. What they found is there's a radial intercalation like at the animal cap, but it's biased to be, to be a, a, between anterior posterior neighbors rather than medial lateral neighbors. So it, 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 aged, it, it adds to the extension of this explant. And then um, also they described the medial lateral intercalation. We thought that it was first this one and then this one, but we now know that the two or, or uh, overlap a great deal. And so these are the processes. Basically, it's like dough. Um, you uh, flatten the thing and elongate it by constraint, by, by the nature of the forces that are generated there. And then uh, to keep it from thickening, that radial intercalation keeps it from thickening and you push it from the sides. The only way to go is extend. Um, now we wanted to get higher resolution of this and John Schur came into this picture heavy. He learned to make these giant explants um, uh, cultured with um, uh, BSA in the medium, and he managed to get them to show the uh, uh, behavior that was underlying this, this extension. 
everyone was always thinking that they had to crawl in the direction that the cells were moving. Wrong. Totally counterintuitive. What they do is they polarize media laterally. They reach out the gray arrows, um, attach, make adhesions, and then shorten. And they inchworm their way between one another using the most power, one of the most powerful mechanical devices known, and that is the wedge effect. So what does this look like? This is the low angle uh, illumination that was so useful for us to characterize these large scale um, uh, tissue movements. And I'll show several other views. You'll notice how they're elongated and they're nosing between one another. It's running pretty slow. Uh, I think I'll just go to the uh, fluorescence. These are the first generation fluorescent molecules that Gimlick and Brown were revising. And this is what it looks like in a confocal uh, with the cytoplasmic, uh, cytoplasmic fill of dextrans, Lance Davidson. And here is a, a uh, membrane uh, tag. It's one color, uh, actually. And what you see in the green is down about five micrometers in the tissue. And you see how these lamellopodian knife edge through between cells that you can't see. They're not labeled. And then the red is up on the surface. So we characterize this movement, this behavior, in some detail uh, using this prep. And in fact, what we, uh, by using the PSA to keep them from sticking down, they make fibronectin on this surface and they'll stick to the dish and then they don't move properly. But this enables us, enabled us to actually study this process of intercalation when there was a lot of intercalation actually going on and from early on. Now the, we characterize the cytoskeleton, this crew here, uh, Lance Davidson before he left and then at, at Pittsburgh. And the cytoskeleton, the actomycin cytoskeleton has these nodes and cables connecting these nodes. Um, uh, they move primarily medial lateral direction and uh, they have the adhesions that connect them across cells or uh, uh, cadherins. This is a part that uh, Chen Bei Chang did. Uh, uh, and this thing is pretty slow. The model is that these cells will make protrusions, they'll attach, and then uh, there'll be a, a cyclic, um, that there's a reiterated contraction of the actomyosin network that Kim and Davidson described, so did Catherine Pfister to a certain extent, that sweeps across centripetally in the cell. And as it does so, these adhesions automatically tense it, uh, it organize the cable from, as, as it contracts, connecting nodes and cables along this axis because that's the way the protrusions are, are local, localized. And they shorten and pull the cells between one another. And that just makes channels of tension through these cells that very, it, it's constantly remodeled. In other words, you got a bunch of sarcomeric units that keep reaching and pulling and shortening. And the tension is transmitted from one end of the whole array to another, as this experiment shows. Dave Shook made giant explants out of these, uh, 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 out of the marginal zone, like this sandwich. And what it does is this, uh, tremendous amount of extension. He simply uh, then fastened uh, these two sleds, um, uh, hooked it up with, uh, with a, a probe, a calibrated probe and measured the force. And, come on. Can't get it to advance. There we go. Um, and it has a porous profile of something like that. Through gastrulation, it rises to about uh, sometimes near two and then much higher as it went, it goes on. Um, now, if you hit it with myosin, what happens is this thing should be contracting and squeezing the blastopore shut. If you hit it with myosin morpholino in increasing doses, you get increasing failure of developing this tension, as you can see here, same profile, but much lower. This is a control for enamel cap. And then if you look at the cytoskeleton, myosin 2B is a crosslinker. And what happens is all these uh, cables that connect these nodes and adhesions, they turn to rubber, uh, they stretch. And so now, even though it looks like there's more contraction here, you're not developing the tension. The max you can get out of it is what it takes to stretch that. 
And so this is the best evidence that we have that, that node and cable is actually generating the uh, global tissue force. Now, the specificity of this though, um, how, how does this, why, how does this close the blastopore? Well, it was totally counterintuitive again, uh, because John Schur, here's the, the pattern. He managed to make these giant explants and then go look at different regions of it. And what this, these arrows mean here is that's the progress of this meal intercalation behavior that I just described from anterior to posterior. And going back to that fate map, this arrow here, they, this, a lot of people think this is dorsal ventral. The fate map says, no, it's anterior posterior. And if you look at the progress, it goes like a progressing hoop. It starts here and those, those uh, uh, the hoops of intercalating cells are anchored at the uh, edge of the vegetal region. And then they spread back like so. How am I doing on time? Just go. Um, so they, what he did was he looked at various places in this array in the explant and then ma we mapped it back on the gastula. So I'm gonna show you a couple of these. This is the onset of this and the pattern goes from lateral, or actually originates in the presumptive Semitic mesoderm and goes toward the midline, not as everybody expected from the midline out. And from that origin, it spreads posteriorly in all these tissues. Um, and I'll show you that there's the vegetal alignment zone. Here are cells that have not got the word yet. And here are the mesoderm, hip crawling mesoderm cells down here. Um, the next one is at the site of notochord somite boundary formation right there. And it's gonna proceed, the boundary is gonna form right in the middle of this vegetal alignment zone here. You can see these cells moving through here. Uh, there's gonna be boundary forming in here and a piece of notochord will get pulled out of the Semitic mesoderm. And then notice the progressivity of this second type of uh, intercalation. It's a later intercalation from anterior to posterior and from lateral to medial. And then vacuolation shows it even more. The uh, notochord then vaculates and it spreads from later, anterior and lateral backwards posteriorly and from this lateral origin toward the midline. So this is an amazing, John's feat of being able to resolve this uh, is amazing. Um, but what it means is it's the most beautiful mechanism. These hoops are anchored or unanchored in the explant. So when they contract, they just pull this back like that and compress this and push it for, push out uh, the nose out in front here. And like so, but over here, when they're anchored, what they do when they shorten is that they roll that entire marginal zone. There's a zone, as this blast support closes, that progress of the MIB is right inside, right inside there. That's the posterior progress zone of it. So it's a very elegant mechanism and it was totally counterintuitive. And these young people solved it. Um, Carmen Domingo, uh, whom many of you on the board know, um, she then did an experiment where she went to another notochord and another explant or an embryo and dug out labeled cells and scattered them at random through this uh, uh, zone here where we knew this front was gonna come back. And guess what? And we won't go through all the data. They adopt the MIB in an order from here, uh, from anterior to posterior and from lateral to medial. Amazing. Um, that's just one thread of many in my lab over the years, and I'll just describe some other things. Uh, what time? Just go. Okay, um, I'm worried about time. Um, Anna Edlin, Tamira Liu, Max Ezen, Anna Rolo. Anna actually had a role in some of these uh, uh, experiments on the mesoderm as well, and she's on a current paper that we're putting out on the second convergence. Uh, this is my neural group here. Uh, they they did some marvelous work on neural uh, convergence and extension. And that, what Anna did was she found out that under certain conditions without a midline, which Max Ezen studied, the midline directed movement in the neural tissue, if you uh, take away the midline in a, in a certain way, these cells still show bipolar, they revert to a bipolar protrusive activity, but it's not, it's not balanced. And it occurs in first one way and then another. 
And so it looks exactly like the one where you constantly have protrusions coming out both ends and then the uh, balance tension. Um, but you don't get, you get a quarter of what you get out of intercalation. You actually get massive intercalation, but no, not much CE. Um, Ann Poznanski also worked on neural. Uh, Amy Sater worked on neural. This is my Evo Devo crew. Uh, Dave Shook belongs to it and to the biomechanics group. Uh, Jessica Boker, she worked on sturgeons. Um, and this is, uh, this is my biomechanics. I'm not a biomechanician. A lot of people think I am. I just collaborate with me. One when, when time a biologist said, you know, Ray, I don't think, I don't see how you can collaborate with those physicists and biologists and, uh, and uh, biomechanicians. They think they're smarter than we are. And I said, you know, they're right. <laughs> anyway, uh, and Carmen, uh, she was part of the whole cell intercalation thing, as was, was down here, Paul Wilson. He now is a big time epidemiologist that works with uh, African nations, uh, uh, epidemiology. John Schreuer, he worked in industry for years. Mike Danilchek, I think he's just retired. Enrique Amaya, he worked on the Remy. Uh, he was, he and Chris Kroll in the Gerhardt lab developed the Remy technique of uh, transgenesis. Um, Paul Scoglin, you heard about what he did. Toshi Goto worked on the PCP pathway. Um, Connie Lane was sea urchins. Mark Cooper and I did some things on electric fields. Barry Sinerva was in the lab. Uh, 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 he was a Miller fellow and was in the lab for a while. Rudy Winklebauer, I could talk for days about that. Uh, he, he was one of the most creative of, of all my students. He's been, he's probably the, uh, the closest thing to Johannes Holtfreder you'll ever see. Um, and both Carol Forrestall and Virginetta Cannon worked on some projects that were sort of unrelated to the other things that Virginetta Cannon did work on some bottle cells. Um, and, um, you know, I should mention some of my mentors. There was uh, uh, other mentors. There was Stokem, there was Trinkus, there was Bob Briggs. But when I was in Indiana, uh, in Illinois rather, uh, David Nanny, a fantastic guy and Carl Woes, Carl Woes. A lot of this counterintuitive stuff that we've uncovered was uh, channeled. Uh, we sort of channeling Carl Woes, who was a, a really great thinker. Took two courses for him: one before the war and one after. What's the time? Oh, you're just finishing. Thank you. Okay. Thank yep. you so much. Thank, thank you all, and thanks for the NSF and NIH.